I was driving around one day and I noticed a big cavern surrounding in a on the block surrounding this little old house and it was clear that they were excavating for some sort of a major building and I was just wondering why that little house was standing still and why they hadn't taken it down. I started asking around and I found out that a uh, old old woman named Edith Macefield lived there and I thought oh that'll be fun to interview her. I tracked down her phone number and called got an answer on the telephone and I said, hello, this is Kathy Milady from the Seattle PI. I'd like to interview you for a story. Slam. My name is Gail Holland. Um, I lived down by the Ballard Bridge um, when I oh, was about five years old. And Edith and her mom moved in oh, a couple years after that. And we got to know Edith. I actually heard about Edith's story from my wife um, when I knew that I was going to do this project. Um, she said, well, down in Ballard, there's a project that's getting ready to go that they're building around some lady's house that doesn't want to move. About a week before I started the project is when I found out that she was here. She was by herself. She didn't have any family. Barry was, um, he was construction uh, with the construction there, and she got to know all the guys. I mean, they all were helping her come in and help her do things. Edith was a, um, a loving person, uh, very caring, um, very considerate, yet she was a very private person. Actually, she was very warm, very humorous, very intelligent. She spoke several foreign languages. Uh, she loved opera. She was very, um, very well educated. And her mind was just as sharp as the tack. She could remember everything. She had an incredible number of stories um, about working as a spy. People wonder if any of them could be true. I, the first few times I heard some of the stories, I'm thinking, crazy old lady. And you know, I did a few things to kind of check out her stories. And I could not find anything that made you think that there wasn't any of them that weren't true. She mentions uh, seeing Hitler at a tea dance one afternoon. You know, she talked about all the guys that she dealt with in the big band and come to find out that Benny Goodman was her cousin. And I think she got a job in an orphanage and later started um, working or maybe running the orphanage on her own. She used to play the saxophone and we loved to listen to her all the time. So. Uh, and then she played golf in, the, in her yard. She had a, a little putt-putt. She also had a lot of um, VCR tapes of old movies. Alfred Hitchcock, and um, which seemed kind of funny that she would be looking at, you know, scary movies. She would want her tapes played, and they were loud, but it, it it drowned it out, all the, the trucks going by and the, all the, the noises that they were doing. Um, there was a few that she had that um, her husband was actually in. And um, we watched those a few times. And uh, she loved to read, loved to write stories. She had um, about eight little books that she wrote, children's books. She used to um, quote poems from uh, Kipling. So there wasn't really any one thing that I could see that she liked in particular. And she loved animals, dogs and cats. She collected little glass animals and when you go by her house they're still on the windowsills in her house. She would always go outside and stand in front of her house and feed the birds. If she hadn't fed the birds by 11 o'clock um, I'd go knock on the door. It seems to me from the time she was a little girl until her last breath, she did her life her way. So I, of course the, the big question that everybody wanted to know from Edith was why she turned down a million dollars and to stay in her, her little house surrounded by loud, noisy construction. I actually kind of liked the construction workers. There was activity going on. They offered her a million dollars for her house. She said no. And after she said no, Edith isn't going to change her mind. But like she said, um, you know, money didn't mean anything. If you look back on her life, 
Her mother died in that little house. Her favorite dog died in that little house. The house for her was filled with memories of her childhood, of her friends, of her family. I think it meant everything to her. I think it was beyond a price. She just wanted to die in her home. After that story ran, I had calls from people um, throughout the United States, but also in Sweden and Norway and uh, Iraq, and I can't remember all the places. You know, Kathy's article came out Monday morning, and by, you know, Monday afternoon, the place was swarmed. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And then what, CBS Evening News, they came down here and camped for, um, for two days trying to get an interview. I was interviewed by Der Spiegel magazine, which is um, the German version of Time. The New York Times, pretty much it was worldwide. You know, I hope that little house stays there, and a lot of people who read this story say they wish that there could be some kind of a, a little monument, maybe a play school or a daycare or something for animals, or if the house has to be torn down because it's so old, maybe a little park could be set up there to remember the woman who refused a million dollars so she could stay in her house. It will be torn down. I would like to see the house torn down, but I would like to see one built just like her house and use it as a coffee shop. I would really like to see that.